Okay, so we're heading into um, to chapter five. And with that, so this is um, we're going to be talking about what we're called enantiomers and diastereomers, specifically stereoisomers. Um, so this is where you have the isomers, um, but they have the same connections. All the bond, all the atoms are connected um, to the same atoms, but their arrangement, how the bonds are arranged in space, is going to be different. Okay, so with that, so this this concept is going to be. A little it's not hard it's just weird so about that so um so if you're not getting it right away don't don't be worried just you got to keep keep working at it okay so about that so there's two different types of stereoisomers uh one are it's called enantiomers this is where they're mirror images of each other okay so about that they're mirror images but they they're not what are called superimposable we'll talk about that in a minute the other type are what are called diastereomers where they are not they you can make the uh, uh where they're Stereoisomers, but they're not mirror images of each other. Okay. Now, in practical terms, what usually happens with enantiomers is that what you've done is you've you've switched all of the wedges and dashes for each other. Okay. So, what used to be a wedge now becomes a dash. What becomes a, what was a dash now becomes a wedge. Um, so, with that, if you do that for the all of those for the molecule, even if there's just one, that means that they're um, the relationship between the two. There are enantiomers. If they're not all then they're what are called if you've not switched them all so let's say there's let's say there's five wedges if you um if you switch four of them to dashes then the relationship between two, those two molecules are um diastereomers okay stuff like that so we'll talk about this more in a minute okay so we first want to talk about the, what's called superimposability okay so like that so what happens is if you can, um, can you get the molecule to fit right on top of each other, okay? Um, and stuff like this. And so the, uh, um, okay, so, with that, so, so for here, what we can do is we can say, okay, we're gonna take the mirror images of these, um, take two molecules, let's say they're, they're mirror images of each other, okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, they're mirror images, right? There's a hydrogen here, there's hydrogens here, green, blue. But if I just rotate this like this, Right, I can ha I can get them to sit right on top of each other, and they're right in right superimposable on each other. So okay, so with that, so this makes them even though they can make mirror images, the fact that they're superimposable makes them makes them the not enantiomers. Enantiomers are not superimposable. Okay, so, so so if we take this and we say okay, we're going to add a red ball to it. So okay, so now they look like this. They're still mirror images of each other. But there's no way that I can rotate this so that they're right, superimposable, right? So the reds are here and the hydrogens are here, but the blues and the greens are incorrect. If I were to make it so that they're correct, the blues and the greens are correct, well, now the hydrogens and the, and the red balls are in the, wrong, are in the wrong spot, okay? So by that, so that's what this means. It means these guys here, they're, they're mirror images of each other, but they're not superimposable. That's what makes them enantiomers, okay? So the, uh, the so your hands are enantiomers. They are not. They are mirror images of each other. Right? You say, well, they look. They look the same. But as they're mirror images of it, right here, the palm, they, there's no way that you can make them superimposable. You say, well, I go like this. Well, the problem with this is that your palms are facing the wrong way. Okay. If I were to twist it so that the palms are the same, right now your thumbs are pointed in the wrong direction. Right. So about that. So there's no way that you can rotate your hand so that they're superimposable on each other. There's a reason why you can sort of think about this as saying, you know, there's no way that you can comfortably put your left hand glove on your right hand. If you could, then there, your left glove is superimposable on top of your left hand. Okay. But there's no way that you can put it on your right hand because your your left and left and right hand are not superimposable. Okay. Okay, so, so to draw the mirror image, okay, uh, what, you, um, what you need to do is you say, okay, where is the mirror? So if you had this molecule here, okay, it's right here. So, so the, mirror, the mirror is going up and down, okay? So that means anything, any bond that's going with the mirror is going to remain unchanged, okay? So we're going to say... This hydrogen carbon hydrogen bond is is with the bond with the mirror, so that means this. All the other bonds are going to be the same, but just point in the opposite direction, right? So this one is a regular bond pointed right, so now you need to be a regular bond pointed left. Okay, here you have a wedge 
pointing left, so you need to have a wedge pointed right. Okay, this we have a bromine, the uh, pointed left, so we need a wedge pointed right. Okay, so these are going to be mirror images of each other. Okay, so if you have the mirror going up and down, that means anything. You know, however the mirror is, those bonds are going to remain unchanged. It's all the other ones that are going to be remain what they are. They're just going to be pointed the wrong way or the opposite way. Okay. So if we have this molecule here, if the mirror image is going is vertical like this, right? So these vertical bonds are going to remain unchanged, okay? Now they still have to stay on, the, stay on the same atoms, right? So, but this hydrogen and that methyl group is going to stay unchanged. But these two guys are pointed right, so that we're going to make sure that they point left now. These two are pointed left, so we're going to make sure that they point right now. And there you go. There's the mirror, there's the mirror image. So there you go. Okay, now chirality. Okay, so with that, so here, what we're saying is that if a molecule can have an enantiomer, then then the molecule is what's called chiral. That's a um, that's a very, so if it, you, if you can make the enantiomer, okay, chiral actually stands for the word hand, right? Because your hand is chiral because you can make an enantiomer of it, right? You can make the non-superimposable mirror image of each of it, right? It's just your left hand, okay? If if you can make um, if you cannot make the, the, an enantiomer, if it does not have an enantiomer twin, then it's, um, then it's what's called achiral or non-chiral. We're talking about the whole molecule here. Okay, so how do we do this, right? Well, we're going to take a look at this. Okay, we're going to say, say we're going to have that right there. So, so okay, we're, we have a vertical, right? So we're going to have this wedge on a vertical. Um, we're going to have our mirror be vertical, so we need to see if we, when we make the mirror image, okay, so now this is, is with the, the plane, right, so with the mirror, so it's still going the same way, but this one here, it's the wedge right, so we need a wedge left, okay, so we rotate this, okay, so that these wedges, um, if we rotate the molecule like this so that the wedges are, are aligned with each other, what ends up happening is this rotates down so it's like that. If you compare these two, all I've done is rotated, done a rotation for this one. So if we compare these two, right, we're, there's no way that we can get this one as a wedge up here. Okay, so these two are an antimer, right? So, so that means because we can make a non, we can make it an antimer, right, that means that this, thing, this guy is chiral. Okay. Now, you can have um, sort of fleeting chiral centers. Okay, so we talked about this uh, before. Okay, so it, so let's see if we get so let's let's build this. Okay, put some paper underneath so you can see it. Okay, so if we make the, it, okay, so, okay, so, so let's say, we're going to make the mirror image, right? Oop, I can't see it. I hope you can see it. Okay. Okay. Make we can make the mirror image. There you go. Now you can see it. Okay. A little hard to see, but here's it. But the problem is, if I just rotate these bonds, now they're superimposable on each other. Okay. So even so, even though we can make the mirror image, the fact that I can just rotate a bond and then get them superimposable means that we, we consider them to be non-chiral. Okay, so just a simple rotation of a bond gets it superimposable, that means ah, that, that won't work. Okay. Now these, 
these one things that you can do is as we talked about in the last chapter we can do these chair flips okay so you have to be wary of those as well I, I'm not going to necessarily test you on these because they are pretty difficult but you have to take into account that can I do a chair flip and ro rotate it and chair flip uh, in order to, to be able to if I make that and a chair flip it to be able to get it to be superimposable okay so if I have the cis one two difluorocyclohexane and do the mirror image then what I can do is I can rotate it um, I can just rotate it to get it here um, the other thing I could do is uh, so those are not superimposable but if I rotate it and do a chair flip um, so that I can actually get them to be superimposable um, so you do have to be careful with those um, stuff like that, but th that that's pretty difficult. This is where you need really do need a, a, uh, a model kit to take a look at these. Okay. The other way that you can do it is to um, if you have a, a Hayworth projection. Okay. So this is where the where you draw these the cycl the, the cyclic structure as a, as a flat plane. It's not. Remember, it's a chair structure. Um, stuff like that, but for ease of, of viewing, basically, you can see these as a, um, you can see the ups and downs more, um, much more easily, right? So if you make the mirror image from this, right, so all you gotta do is just put it right back on top of each other, and that makes, and you can see that they are superposable in each other. But if you have something like this, right, so if you have the trans version, what you can do is there's no way that you can rotate this or flip it or whatever it is so that these guys are superimposable. So the cis one too, right, so this is the same molecule as this, Right, so that would be really difficult to see in the um, in the chair form, um, but here you can look pretty quickly as as to whether they're superimposable or not in this in this Hayworth um, projection model. Okay, stereo centers. Okay, so these are often called a chiral center, so you have to be really careful because I switch between the two. A chiral center, okay, just means an atom that has um, an atom that has four different groups hanging off it. Most of the time it's carbon, but it's not. But a chiral molecule, okay, uh, is going to have to have at least one of those chiral centers, okay? We'll talk about a, a, a quirk where achiral molecules have chiral centers, but that's beyond, uh, that's for later. That's a very weird class, okay? So what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to take a look at, at, at a molecule and saying, like, are there four different things, okay? So here, so if I have... Um, Right, so if I have this molecule here, right, I have hydrogen and, and chlorine, right? So I only have one, two, I have, yeah, there's four bonds, right? But these two, I have two chlorines hanging out there. They're the same thing. So that, that means that they're not, um, that they're, it's not a chiral center, okay? But if I were to do, um, if I were to say, you know, this fluorine, oop. Chlorine, take the same molecule, but instead switch this out for, say, a bromine. Now I've got hydrogen, bromine, fluorine, chlorine. Okay, now this is chiral. Okay, and stuff like that. And so one of the things you're going to want to do is just like um, stuff like that. So as you're checking these things out, if they're so, um, you're going to want to look directly at the four, the four atoms attached. To the, so we're interested in that chiral center. We're going to see the four things attached. Now. What's going to happen is, if there, you look at the atoms attached, if there's a tie, okay, then you're, you're going to want to look at the, um, you're going to want to take a look at the, um, the bonds, okay. So with that, so are is are there still the bonds attached, right? So, so for this one here, right. So with that, so um, F. H and then here, right? So you notice here, I knew where the hydrogen was on this one here because most bonds are going to need two regular lines, a wedge, and a dash. Remember, I don't have to draw the carbon hydrogen bond, so if I see the wedge and the two regular lines, that means that the hydrogen's on a dash. Same thing goes here, right? I see the two regular lines, but there's but the fluorine's on a wedge, that means that the hydrogen, which it's, it's there, but I don't have to show it, is on a dash. Okay, so so this is CH2, 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 CH2. Okay, so so if I'm interested in this, that carbon there, okay, so we have a, a fluorine, a hydrogen, a CH2, and a CH with a fluorine hanging off of it. Well, those are four different things, right? Okay, so that means this is a chiral center. Okay, S 
Same thing goes with here. Right? We have a hydrogen, a fluorine, a CH2, and then a CH with a, uh, with a fluorine inhibit. Those are four different things. Okay, so that makes this to be a chiral center. Okay, so each one of those are a chiral center. If you get to this point, okay, and there's and there's a tie, what you do is you then go up, walk out one more, uh, one more atom, and you keep going. And is that a tie? If if it is, then you keep going. And either one of two things are going to happen: either you're going to get to the end of your chain, in which case then 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 they're, they're, those two sides are the same. Or you're going to find a difference. As soon as you find a difference, you can stop. Okay. Okay. So here we go. So the book likes talking about planes of symmetry. I like looking at, at the four different things. I think the four different things are a little bit easier to see. Okay. Now, when looking for these, okay, looking for the stereo centers, what you're going to want to do is, so let's say I give you a molecule like this, and you're going to say. Circle all the stereo centers. Okay, the easiest thing, to, the, the best place to start is with the hydrogens. Okay, so, so right, so so let me put in. You can put in the dots if you want. That sometimes helps. Okay, remind you where all those carbons are. Okay, so this dot here, right, it has one bond shown. So that means the right carbon needs four bonds, right? So so that means the other three bonds that this carbon has are are um, are hydrogens. Okay. This one here, three bonds are shown, so that means the fourth one has to be a hydrogen. Same thing here, two bonds are shown, so it means the other two have to be hydrogen. So it's a CH2, same thing here, CH2, 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 right? Here, three bonds shown, so that means that the fourth bond has to be a hydrogen. Same thing here, three bonds shown, so the fourth one's of hydrogen. And here, only one bond is shown off of this, um, this dot here, so this last one has to be a CH3. Now. The CH3, these guys here all are, um, have more than one hydrogen, right? You cannot have two hydrogen, two or three hydrogens hanging off of a carbon to have it be chiral, right? Because it's the same group. So we can just go ahead and, and cross these off, right? So there's no way that those could be. So it's a really quick way to zoop, get rid of all of them. Now we don't know if those, if these, these three are left, we don't know if those are chiral, but, um, but we definitely know that these aren't. Okay, so we can narrow the list down. So now we need to look at this treatment, right? So we got so we take a look at say this one here, right? We have a CH3, a hydrogen, an OH, and a CH. Well, those are those are all different, right? So with that, so that makes that one a chiral center, right? So there's an OH group, there's an H, there's a CH3 and a CH, right? All of those are different. Okay, so that's good. Okay, so for here, right, off of this, and so when you when you look at a different one, you just you go and reset yourself. Okay, you wipe everything away. Right. So with this, so for here, right, we have a CH group with an alcohol hanging off of it. We have an H. We have a CH2 and a CH2. Well, these two these two groups here are different, right? But we don't know about these two. So this is still a tie. So what do we do? We go one further in, right? So now we have a CH2 versus a CH. Okay, that there's a difference here. That means this side of the this side of the ring is different than that side of the ring. Okay, so that we consider that to be one, two, three, four groups. Okay, so that makes that makes this a chiral center. Okay, here the other potential one, right? So we have a CH three, we have an H. Well, okay, those are different. We have a CH two, CH two. Okay, well these are a tie. So let's keep going. So then we go here, right? We have CH two and a CH. Well, there's a difference here. That means this side of the ring is different from that side of the ring. So again, we have four different groups. So there's your chiral center. So that's how you do it. Go in, write in your hydrogens. You're going to need to get that anyway. Um, and eliminate what you de know is definitely not a, a chiral center. And then you can go in and start looking at, you go from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine potential ones down to three. Now it, you can go through them a lot quicker. Okay? So with that. So, okay, so for here, right? So with that, so. Okay. Again, the first thing you want to do is you want to take a look at these, um, at the, um, put in the hydrogens, right? So there's a hydrogen here, there's a hydrogen here, right? Because each one of these has three bond, each one of these has three bonds shown, 
right? So there's a hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. This one, two bonds are shown. This one's two bonds shown. Okay. So let's start. Let's start over here, right? So we have a CH2, a CH3, a hydrogen, and a CH. Well, that those are four different things. So we're going to say that's a chiral center. Okay. What about on this side, right? So we have a CH3. It looks a lot like this side. So CH3, an H, a CH2, and a CH. Right, right, so there's a CH group here. Well, those are those three are different, or those four are different. So that's a chiral center. Okay, so what about this one? Here we have a, a, a CH3, an H, a CH, and a CH. And each one of these CHs have a, has a methyl group hanging off it. Well, they're, they're basically they're the same. So what do we do? We keep going down here, right? So we have a CH2 and a CH2. And now we're at, we're at the end of our ring, right? So but that so that means we're sort of at the end of the line. Right, to see if they're different. That means from this guy's perspective, this side and this side are the exact same. So therefore, this isn't a chiral center. Even though it's got a wedge and a dash, it, it's not a chiral center. There's actually only two chiral centers here. It's just those two here. Okay. Now, if we take a look at this one here, now we've already said, right, this, well, here, let's go ahead and put in the hydrogens, right? So... Now this one is a CH2 with a CL hanging off of it. Okay, so like we said before, those two are CH2, CH2. Okay, so for here, right, there's, right, so from this carbon here, CH3, an H, a CH2, and then this one here is just a CH, right? So that's all, all those are different, right? So that's a chiral center. Now here on this side, right, so we have a CH2, a CH, an H, and well, we have a CH2 here, but this one has a car, the, the fourth bond in this one is a chlorine. This one here is a carbon, right? So that means that this side is different from that side. So that's a chiral center. Now for this one here, remember we said on this one it wasn't, but here we have, right, a CH versus, you know, CH3, an H, a CH, and a CH, but here it's a methyl group. Here it's a methyl group with a chlorine hanging off of it. These two things are different. Okay, so that means from this guy's perspective, this side of the molecule is different from this side of the molecule. We've broken the symmetry right here. There's a nice plane of symmetry that goes right through that, right? So that's that's a mirror image of that one. Okay, so on this side, right, we've broken that symmetry. That chlorine over here, you know, was it the, uh, you know, has is is different here. It'd be like looking in the mirror and and you have two ears and then in in the mirror it has three, right? Something's wrong. Okay, so like that. So here, now that is. A stereo center. Okay. Ooh. Okay, so here it's just those two. Here it's all three. Let's do here it's all three. Okay. Okay, now just to mess with your guys' heads, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, if if we have a um, chiral center chiral carbons within the molecule, okay, but there is in fact a plane of symmetry, okay, those molecules are called Chiral. Okay. So let me just help with the lighting here. Um, those are called chiral. Okay. So we've already seen it with this one here, right? So with this, so for this one, notice how there's a, there's two chiral centers here, but there is a plane of symmetry. Okay. And this and this one here, right? So with this, so this one is what's called a meso compound. Okay. And I'll show you the consequence of that. Okay. See, it's built this thing. Oops. So this is sort of the classic meso compound. Okay, so here. Okay, we're going to build the mirror image of this. So they are the mirror images of each other. It's kind of hard to see. Oops. Okay, they're the mirror images of each other. But, and we said that there's chiral centers, right? We figured that out. But the problem is, what can happen is, notice how they're, they are superimposable on each other, right? The, the, here, the, these, red, these red balls are right on top of each other. They're superimposable on top of each other. So what's happened with meso compounds is that you get, you have a chiral carbon, okay? You have chiral centers in this, okay? But... Because there's this crazy plane of symmetry, and you can see this here, okay? There's a, uh, right? So, so you can see it. My hand was out of the way. Yep. 
there's a plane of symmetry that goes right through here. Okay. Um, so by that, because of that, um, then they are in fact it is in fact a um, uh, the molecule over the molecule is not chiral, but it does have chiral centers, right? We determine that these two carbons are chiral centers, but the molecule itself is not. Okay, so it's not going to behave as if it's a chiral molecule. It's kind of weird, but um, stuff like that. It's it's one of those things where it doesn't pop up very much, uh, very often, but it does definitely pop up on tests. Okay, so if we have this molecule here, right, bromine. Chlorine, right? Stuff like that. So there's no way that we can, you know, if we put a plane of symmetry there, well, that that side has a chlorine. This one doesn't. If we put it here, right? There's a bromine on one side and a chlorine on the other. Well, that's not going to do. So this is chiral. There's no way that you can make that plane of symmetry. So this one's chiral. Okay. So if we put, if we replace that that bromine with a chlorine or with, with this chlorine with another bromine, well, now we have a plane of symmetry here. Okay. That side is the mirror image of this side. Oops, so this is so this is in fact a chiral. Okay, it's meso. Okay, now don't be confused, right? So if that's so if I were to, to make so this is the, the cis version, right? Where they're both coming up. Okay, so if I were to make if I were to make the trans version like this, okay. If I were to make the mirror image of, the mirror image of the molecule like this. Now this, there's no way that I can make these superimposable. They're actually, it's hard to see, but they're, they're facing the wrong way. Whoop. There we go, so you can see it in the picture. Okay, they're non-superimposable on each other and there's no way that I can twist this thing to do it. So just because you have things here, if I were to have bromines one up, one, you know, one wedge, one dash, that's actually chiral, okay, because there's no plane of symmetry, right, so like that. So, you know, here, right, for here, the bromines are pointed up like this. Here, the bromines over this. So in order to do the mirror image, you'd have to have it up, up top again. Okay, so, so be careful. Now for here, right, you can look at it two different ways. And actually, a student showed me this. Okay, I pointed this out. In that there is a plane of symmetry that goes through here. And in fact, there's actually a plane of symmetry that goes through there as well. But if you look at this, so there's there is a there is a hydrogen here. There is in fact no chiral centers in here, right? Because you have, on this one here, it's a, let me draw these out. So CH two CH two, right? You have a hydrogen, a, a chlorine, right? A CH two a CH two. So what do you do? You got to move out one. Well, now you come back to right here, right? So this side of the molecule is exactly the same as that side of the molecule. So in fact, there's no chiral centers in this molecule. So it has to be a chiral, right? You know, it's meso. It's not even chiral. Okay, so there you go. Okay, so this one is a little tougher. Okay, so with that, so here again, you're, you're going to want to make um, this is where models come in. Models can help. Okay, so if you have these, okay. Okay, so I made the mirror images of each other, but in order to take, to, well, like I say, so you, you can look at the plane of symmetry here, right? So yes, the, the, the OHs are pointed the same way, but, right, the methyls aren't. So we need to rotate the molecule here so that the methyls are in the same plane, but the problem is, right, the OHs are in the wrong position, right, to be, to be mirror images of each other. So you can do that, right? You can twist it to see if they become mirror images of each other, okay? And they don't. So this so this one, even though they're pointed the same direction, because you have to rotate the molecule to get the methyls in the right position, they are in fact, this is in fact a, a chiral compound. Here, if I were to make it like this, and you sort of see, right, so you start off with them pointed in the opposite direction, okay? But if I rotate them like this, well, whoop, right there, All right? Now there's a nice plane of symmetry that goes right through here. Okay, so in fact this one's meso. If you rotate it, they're not. There's no mirror image there, but for here there is. Okay? So you have to be careful. So with with non-cyclic compounds. Okay, now now we talked about chiral carbons, and in fact what happens is they don't have to be um, 
carbons at all. All they have to do is have four groups on there. So a classic one is nitrogen. Okay, the problem is, right, so, and actually lone pairs can be, a, can be considered a group and they would function just like everything else. Okay, now for here, right, so here a, a quaternary ammonium ion, right, it has a methyl, um, an ethyl, a, a propyl, and a phenyl group here. Okay, so those are four different groups on this one. I don't know why this has got so dark. Um, okay, um, and stuff like that. So, um, but the uh, um, but the nitrogen will still do this. Okay, with this one, it has if it has lone pairs. Yes, it will. Uh, this is chiral. The problem is the uh, um, the. This is, and this is just a quirk for nitrogen. The other ones don't do this. Um, you get this sort of tunneling effect, and what will actually happen is um, the lone pairs will actually tunnel through the uh, the nitrogen and actually push the groups to the other side. Okay, so unless you're under really cryogenic conditions, if you made this molecule and warmed it up to room temperature, you would instantly get the enantiomer because the the lone pairs would go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. It just happens with nitrogen. It's one of those quirky little things. Okay, you can get this inversion here. So if you start off with this one, so let's say, and we'll talk about this in the next chapter. If you get the R, the opposite one is the S, and so you actually get these whopping through and stuff like that. So it sort of goes back and forth. Okay, but for other atoms, you can actually get, um, you can have this be stable. Okay, and so one of the classic examples of this is what's called a meprazole. So you know it, a meprazole is um, Prilosec. Okay, so this is from AstraZeneca, and they were working on this, and, and all throughout the 90s, they had a patent on this. And so uh, what they did is, and what a patent does is it, it excludes anybody else from, from being able to sell your idea. So in this case, it was the, the, the Prilosec. Okay, and so what happened was they had both, both, it's this, um, the, both of its enantiomer in one pill. Okay, and so the chiral center is actually right here on the sulfur. Okay, so you have this big group, that big group, the o, the oxygen, and the lone pair. Those are your those are your um, chiral center, or that that's your chiral center here. But it has both enantiomers in it. So what they did is they said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to separate out the enantiomers so that what we're going to do is we're going to say we notice that the what's called the S version. Again, we'll talk about that in the next chapter. So that is in this particularly, this particular enantiomer is the more potent of the two, okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna make this, we're gonna make a pill that only has this, okay? And so we're gonna, so when we do the trial, so FDA comes in and says, is, is your stuff better? So what they did is they said, okay, we're gonna compare, this is on the market as a 10 milligram pill. We're gonna make this as a 10 milligram pill as well, okay? And then oh, lo and behold, the, lo and behold, what's, um, what happens is this works better, but what's actually happening is you have five milligrams of the S and five milligrams of the R version and here. Here you have 10 milligrams of the S. So effectively what you're doing when you take in this is just doubling the dose. And so what they were able to do is, is they were able to get a new patent on this and they were, and did a massive marketing campaign. And so they were able to keep without doing much, um, the uh, with their clinical trial is to just come in and keep this molecule on patent essentially well this one they were able to keep this one went generic but this one was able to maintain patent and, and peak peak sales in hit in 2012 um was four billion dollars it went off patent in 2014 but think about the tens of billions of dollars that they were able to extend by just making a pill that is basically twice as much okay this is what's this um this is um, not common, but it, it happens where, um, and this is what's called evergreening in the pharmaceutical, and the pharmaceutical industry rightfully gets, um, gets sort of bashed for this, um, because they're not necessarily making much, very many things better, but they can extend the patents and make a, a, a lot of money, uh, off of this stuff, okay? Another thing that you can do with this, um, and this, this popped up, and it was actually, this, the book was a couple of years old, but this one came out in 2016, which is, this year, um, there what you can make these motors, and this one actually won in uh, 2016. That this was awarded the Nobel Prize in chemistry, and essentially what you can do is you can hit these things with light, 
All right, and you can actually switch the R and the S versions of these things around. Um, so that you can switch these um, the stereo isomers with lights and basically make these little you can sort of see these you sort of think of these as your four tires you can get them to rotate and get this molecule to go move in one direction it's pretty cool so about that so I mean as a uh, you know down the road these could be used as very sort of my, um, you know atomic scale little motors stuff like that so it's pretty cool stuff Okay, so we've been talking about enantiomers where you're mirror images of, us, of each other, but if, if you have uh, a stereoisomer, that is in fact where you have not made the, uh, um, the uh, what is it, the, um, uh, where, you need the uh, where you have a, two stereoisomers, but they are not mirror images of each other, you get a, what are called diastereomers. Now in practical terms, what's, again, what's happening is, so for here to here, we've switched all the wedges and dashes, right? So we've switched this wedge for a dash, right? There's only one, so, but we've fulfilled that requirement that there's only one and we've switched it, so therefore these are enantiomers. Here there's two enantiomers, okay? And the, uh, um, what was it, the, uh, um, here it's, you've switched this one from a wedge to a dash, but we've, we've kept this one as a dash, okay? So we have not switched them all. So this is a diastereomer, okay? And stuff like that, and so you can sort of see, you know, if you have three of them here, right? You go what, um, dash, or excuse, yeah, da, or excuse me, wedge dash dash, right? Go wedge wedge wedge, right? So we've kept this one the same, but we've switched these two. So these are diastereomers. Here we've switched, you know, we three dashes to go into three wedges. So these are enantiomers. We've switched them all. Here we've only switched two. So, okay. So the maximum number of of potential stereoisomers you can get between enantiomers and diastereomers is in fact 2 to the power of, of n, where n is the number of stereoisomers you have. So if you have one chiral center, you can have the two, right? So you have the two, the pair of enantiomers. Now, here you can have, um, if you have two, four. If you have three chiral centers, it's eight, four, 16, five, 32, six, 64, and so on and so forth. And actually, so I've got a, a um, a YouTube video down here if you have the slides. If not, go on YouTube and take a look at what's called the um, the Legend of the Chessboard, um, stuff like that. So, okay, and stuff like that. And so there you go. So for drawing diastereomers, sorry, stuff like that. So what you can do is you can say, okay, um, right, so you can make these, right, so you have the four different wedges and dash configurations, right, so you have both of these as a wedge, Okay, both of these are the dash, and then here you can have wedge dash and dash wedge, that, okay. Now the problem is, okay, if you just flip this over, these are in fact, because they're meso, right, you can see, see the, the plane of symmetry here, the, these in fact are the same. The, these two here are the same molecule, okay? And so really, there's only three potential stereoisomers. There, there's actually only three, okay? Now this number is the total maximum number, right? So I drove through four, right? Because there was two stereocenters, okay? But in fact, these two are the same, so there's really only three isomers. It's, it, but this tells you the maximum number, okay? So. Yeah. Hey, can somebody bring me a, a charger? A charger? Yes. Yes. Okay, now another thing is what are called a, a way that you can draw these things, okay, is was developed by Emil Fisher. Okay. Um, stuff like that. So Emil Fisher was one of the, 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 the great chemists of our of our times. Stuff like that. So the uh, um, stuff like that. So this one here is the uh, um, and so what he decided to do, and this is primarily used for carbohydrates and amino acids. Okay, what he did is he said, okay, if we have vertical lines, okay, here and here, okay, we're gonna say those are wedges. Yeah. If we have a, a horizontal line. Okay, it's a dash. Okay, so this one would be, all right, so if we have a carbon here, right, 
these would be like this, these would be like this. Okay. Okay, so I think you should sort of think of one of the ways you can sort of think of these as, as, as being a bow tie. Okay, get this here so you guys can see. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so now the quirky thing is, okay, you have to be careful about these because if you were to rotate these 90 degrees, okay, what's going to happen is what you're doing is you're switching, right, the, the horizontal or the horizontal for wedge or horizontal for vertical, vertical becomes horizontal. What you're doing is you're switching the, what is a wedge and a dash. So if you rotate it 90 degrees, right, so with that, so what you're doing is you're switching all the wedges and dashes. So you're making the enantiomer of it. Right? So you have to be careful, right? So if you make, if you rotate it 90 degrees, you're making the, you're actually, what you're doing is you're drawing it uh, as the enantiomer. But if you do it 180 degrees, right? Th this th th comes down here and that goes over there, right? You're maintaining the wedges and the dashes, or you, you know, the horizontal and the vertical, so you're maintaining the wedges and the dashes, so it's actually the same molecule. So you can do, ver you can do it 180 degrees, but doing 90 degrees doesn't work. Well, it does, you just make the enantiomer. Okay, so be careful with that. Okay, and so the reason why the, these works, the reason why we use these, okay, are for uh, what are called carbohydrates. Okay, so we have D-allose, D-glucose, L-glucose. Okay, so here, notice how all the hydroxyls are, are on this, are on the right side. Okay, so with that, so these are, um, right, so with that, so, for, but for here, right, so we've switched it so that three of these are on the right side and one of these is on the left. So here, what we've done is we've actually, um, we've uh, made the diastereomer. We've switched only one of them, okay? But for here, for enantiomers, right, we've switched all four of these. So it goes here, 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 and here, right? And this is the exact mirror image, you know, of each of them. And so these are in fact enantiomers of each other, okay? Okay, so now, now there is some worried about converting skeletal to fissure, um, something like that. It's kind of a pain in the butt. Nobody really uses it because most of the time this is carbohydrates and so you don't have to do this. But all you got to do is, is you sort of rotate the molecule and you can do this with a model kit. Basically make it so that the verticals sort of go as wedges, or excuse me, as dashes, okay, and the horizontal come out like this. So, so if you have a model, model like this, what you're going to want to do is rotate it so that the molecule, you know, goes down. And so you have all the verticals as dashes and all the um, wedges, um, all the horizontals as wedges, and then you can sort of rotate it back, um, stuff like that, so, and then draw it like that, stuff like that. But I, I don't think it's a particularly useful skill. It's kind of, there's bigger fish to fry in this, in this um, chapter, okay? Now, one of the things to do, one of the things to note, okay, is that the, chem the, um, the chemical properties of isomers, okay? So we've been talking about these uh, before, okay? And that if you have constitutional isomers, okay? So this is, they have the same formula, but they have completely different names, okay? So here we have, pent you have um, one pentene versus two pentene, okay? They're gonna have different melting points and boiling points, right? So one pentene is melting points negative 165, the boi uh, uh, for two pentene, the melting points negative 140, okay? So the melting and boiling points are gonna be different. They're gonna be similar, but they're gonna be different. Okay, and it turns out that enantiomers have, in fact, the same chemical and physical properties. Okay, so if they're enantiomers of each other, so here you've got the mirror images of it, they have the exact same boiling point. Okay, they have the same solubility, they have the same solubility in, in ethanol and DMSO and, and hexanes and water and whatever. They're going to have the exact same solubility. Okay, there's, in fact, only two differences be that um, enantiomers um, have, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, but otherwise they have the same melting and boiling point. Okay, one of those is how they interact with other chiral molecules. Okay, so in fact, your body is filled with chiral molecules. All biological, basically all biological molecules are chiral. So all your proteins, all your lipids, all that sort of stuff. Okay, and so in fact, if you have, um, you have this one, this version of Carvone, okay, um, it is in fact, what's, it tastes like caraway. So it's sort of a very savory one. But here, the mirror image of it, of carvone, tastes like spearmint. Here, 
asparagine, which is an amino acid, okay, this one tastes sweet, but the mirror image of it tastes bitter, okay, and for taste, it's not that big of a deal, okay, but it can be incredibly important in, um, in biological systems, right, because, um, because of the issue of the classic case is thalidomide, okay, in fact, um, this was developed in the 1950s to help, as a sedative, to help women with, um, with morning sickness, so pregnant women with morning sickness, okay, so, but it wasn't ethical to, to so to treat, or to test this on, on, um, on pregnant women, so, what, so, of course, the classic thing they did was tested it on men, and it worked just fine on men, uh, but the problem is they had both, both enantiomers in there, it turns out one enantiomer works really well as a sedative, the other enantiomer, in fact, is a teratogen, which caused massive birth defects, so loss of limbs, her limbs didn't form, um, and other sort of other issues. And it wasn't until, um, a, you know, sort of a, a, a nurse, I believe, over in England, or excuse me, as a doctor, a female doctor, over in, in England, um, stuff like that. So she ended up um, uh, noticing this and sort of really pushed for this, and they were able to get it banned as quickly as possible. It took a little bit longer to get banned over, over in the States, but, but eventually they did. Um, stuff like that, but it was a case where um, you had both an enantiomers. Now it was a little quirky because you could say, "Well, why don't you just um, why don't you just make a molecule that's just the one enantiomer?" Well, remember we talked about where the chiral center is is in fact part of the nitrogen. Okay, and remember we talked about with nitrogens that lone pair can come in and and flip. Okay, and stuff like that. And so um, if you had the 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 correct enantiomer, what would happen is over time it would actually you it would you would start to um, create the wrong enantiomer. So you, you gotta be really careful about that. This is actually still on the market. Um, so by that, it's actually it's actually a pretty good um, treatment for leprosy, of all things. Um, yeah, I bet you didn't know that was still around. Um, that's still a thing, uh, still a disease that's around. Um, but this and the, these sorts of classes of drugs have these giant black box, war black, what's called black box warnings of saying, this is an important drug, so we need to keep it on the market. But if you're on this and you're a woman, you're gonna get tested um, you're gonna make. They're gonna make sure you're on birth control, some sort of contraceptive, some sort of birth control, and you get have to get a blood. You have to get a um, pregnancy test every single month, um, stuff like that. So there's there's one of these things is um, this very similar class of molecules. I can't remember what the name of the drug is, but it's used to treat acne. And again, it has that black box warning because it has this potential um, for massive birth defects. So you have to be really careful with it. Okay. So, we're, but for diastereomers, they in fact they they work just like regular constitutional isomers. They have um, they have different solubilities. They have slightly different solubilities, slightly different melting points, boiling points, things like that. Okay. So, okay. So, and this one, I'm not sure where you put these slides in here, but um, for double bonds, okay, so like that. So we're going to take a quick step to the side, okay. Um, and again, I don't know why you put it in here, but to just as, a, as an aside, uh, if you have a um, an alkene, okay, the more group, the fewer hydrogens you have on it, the better, okay. The, especially the more carbons you have on it, the better, okay. So the least substitute. So um, so if you only have if you have three hydrogens sitting directly off of that double bond, that's the worst case, okay. That's going to be incredibly unstable. It's, it's going to be the end. If it's buried inside your molecule where there's all there's no hydrogens on there or one. Okay, so with that, it's what's called tetris, you know, it's sub highly substituted, so you've substituted the hydrogens for something else, okay, that's very good for the molecule, okay, so with that, so that's the trend, okay, now, all right, so with that, and so um, the, other, the other rule of thumb is that generally cis isomers are going to be less stable than trans, right, because you're going to have the big groups, Okay, and up here, the big groups are right next to each other, so there's gonna be some repulsions. Um, here, in the trans, they're gonna be pointed away from each other, so these are gonna be more stable, generally. Okay, um, the big, um, one of the big, uh, big exceptions for this is when you have, when it, with the double, the alkene is part of a double bond, okay, or excuse me, part of a cyclic structure, right? This is actually gonna be the more stable, okay? The hydrogens are both pointed the same, um, the same way, away from the double bond. Um, so this is, in fact, the cis version. But you wouldn't be able to make the molecule come around and, and you know, connect in through here to make the trans. It's just going to be too difficult. If you try with the, um, you'd have to get a very, very big ring in order to be able to do that. Probably about an eight-membered ring might be able to do it, and and larger. But if you get smaller than, there's no way that you can make the trans. So by default, the cis is going to be more stable. Um, with that, so. Okay.
back to back to stereoisomers, okay? So we talk about different properties, okay, and stuff like that. And so if you have an antimers, okay, and again, we're going to talk about this. Um, say you have the R enantiomer and the S enantiomer. Again, we're going to talk about what that means next chapter, okay? What you can do, okay, so let's say, okay, let, let's draw this out. Let me talk, not talk about R and S yet. Okay, so let's say you have, um, let's say you have um, this. This molecule here. Okay, so they are in fact an antimers, right? The stereo center is right here, right here, and here. And we switched it, so they're an antimers. They're going to have the exact same chemical properties. Okay, so what you can do is you can react it with, say, um, another chiral center, like this, and you'll make what's called the you'll make the ester, and so what you would get is. You would make this molecule here. Oops, there's, a, there's, a, there's an ester here. Okay, here, notice that we've kept the stereocenters. Here, now there's two stereocenters, right? Here it's the same, here it's different. Okay, so but that's so in fact now, so these are enantiomers. Now these are diastereomers. These we can separate out. So we so we separate that out. So we only have this. Okay? And then we lop off that group to get back to our original molecule, right? Okay? So we can lop off that group and get back to, and recover the original one. So now we don't have any of this around. So if we can we can get this, we can make these into temporary diastereomers, okay? And then lop lop off that extra thing that we added to it, then we can separate these things out. We can separate otherwise there'd be no way that we could do it. Okay? So how do we do it? We make them into temporary, we either react them with a molecule or we put in um, a chiral salt. Okay? We make them into temporary diastereomers, we separate them and you know, separate them because now the diastereomers we can do that, um, and then we remove. You know, when we just have them, you know, two buckets of each, each, an, you know, one enantiomer in this in this bucket, another enantiomer in this bucket. Then we take them away. Uh, we lop off what made them diastereomers, and then we get we can recover what we originally had. So that's the strategy you usually use. Okay. Now the other thing that we can do. So the other thing that um, that enantiomers um, interact with is what's called plane polarized light. It sounds kind of weird, but um, that's what happens. Okay, um, like that. And so, what you get is if you just have a light source, whether it's a sun or a light bulb or whatever. Okay, the light's going to come out in, in all different planes. Okay, it's going to come out this and this way and this way and this way and this whatever. Okay, you go through what's called a polarizer. Okay, and, it, and only the stuff that uh, is going with the with the polarization gets through. Okay, so you sort of think if you have a lap, if you have like two slats of wood with a with a um, with a string with a rope going between it, and you and you, if you were to, let's say the it go, the, the slats were like this. If you were to take the, um, if you were to take the string and like this, it would just whack against this, right? The other the other side of the string that's on the other side of the slats isn't going to move much, right? But if you whip it like this with how the gap of the, of the wood is going, right, you're going to translate that through, and the other side is going to go like this. That's exactly what's going on here. The uh, um, What's happening with with this is this is what you see with if you have like polarized sunglasses or regular glasses or whatever the the sort of ones that cut down on glare. So glare is the ones that that sort of come in and sort of bounce off the um, sort of um, go off the uh, um, what is it like you know you know different surfaces. Okay, those get blocked out by the polarization and stuff like that. And so that um, so that's so only some of the light gets through. Okay. Turns out that molecules, the enantiomers, are going to rotate that polarized light in opposite directions. Okay, and so so one enantiomer is going to rotate it clockwise. Okay, so if it comes in like this, it's going to come out clockwise. Opposite, the other enantiomer is going to 
goes in here, it's going to come in one way and then rotate it counterclockwise. Okay, it just so happens to do that. It's kind of weird. Okay, and this was actually incredibly so. If it bends it clockwise, we call that the D or the plus enantiomer. Okay, counterclockwise rotation, we call that the L or, or the um, for lever rotation. Okay, it's either the L or the minus enantiomer. And these are in exper experimentally now. Um, you have to test these. Okay, there's some. Um, there's been a lot of work, and they're getting be much better at being able to predict it, um, stuff like that. But for most of the things, they're still done experimentally okay the way that this was originally seen okay so that and it turns out that if you have a mixture of these two okay if you have the D and the L in there what happens is they um, they will come in and um, knock each other out so the first the first molecule will come in there and rotate a little bit to the clockwise counterclockwise and the other one will do it clockwise and you know it's sort of it. so if you have both the D and L inversion there's there's actually it's not gonna be any rotation Okay, and so what happens is, is they had this back in the 1800s. There were, there were, um, there was this compound called sodium ammonium tartrate. Okay, and this was one of the. So this is um, similar to cream of tartar. Okay, that, and uh, which you probably have in your kitchen. Okay, so it was actually they actually scraped this off. Um, tartar means hard. Okay, it was the sort of white stuff that that would crystallize out on the inside of wine casks. And they would take a look at this, and sometimes they would have it, if they measured it, sometimes it would be um, rotate clockwise, other times it would turn counterclockwise, and sometimes it wouldn't do it at all. Okay, and so what, um, so um, Lavoisier, right, so like that, excuse me, not Lavoisier, Pasteur um, of the pasteurization fame, okay, he was studying chemistry, he was a chemist first, before he, he became famous as a microbiologist. Um, he, he took a solution, he took a solution of the, the sodium ammonium tartrate that, that didn't bend polarized light and just let it sit out and let the water evaporate and it formed crystals, right? So like that. And so what he did is he looked at those crystals under a microscope and he noticed that there was two slightly different versions of the crystal and they were in fact mirror images of each other. And so he very, very laboriously picked out and separated the crystals you know, into individual pots. You know, the, the one one version of the crystal went in one one little beaker, and the other one went into the other little beaker. And what he did is he then dissolved that. You know, the individual crystal, you know, like the the crystals all looked one way, and into the water, and those oh, those bent clockwise. And then the other crystal, the other crystals that had the opposite form, he put that in the polarizer, and they they burnt, they um, bent like the opposite way. And so what he was able to prove was that in fact when you when you, you have these molecules, you have both enantiomers in there, um, they will in fact knock each other out. And so it won't actually bend light, um, won't bend light. Uh, excuse me, not bend light, rotate the light. Okay. Now he didn't know why, um, stuff like that, but it was, um, and so, but he was able to show that. Okay. And so you see this with the, when we talked about the carvone and the asparagine, right? So we have the, the negative or the L versions, the caraway, the plus. Uh, tastes like peppermint of carvone, and the negative is a sweet taste of asparagine, but the positive, uh, the clockwise rotating version, will uh, has a bitter taste. Okay? Not that you, so that you need to know that, but not necessarily know this. This, okay. So optical activity, okay, means that it's a chiral molecule. So sometimes you say, you know, which of these is an optically active compound. All that means is that the molecule is chiral. It will bend light. It will rotate light. Excuse me, it just should say rotate. It's a bad habit of me. It should say rotate light. Non-optically active means it's an achiral molecule. It does not rotate the light, okay? Polarized light. So you can actually measure this, okay? So it's gonna be your, um, whatever your rotation is gonna be. Um, it's just specific rotation, so, so it's a constant. Okay, and it depends on the temperature and it depends on the wavelength. Okay, so what you do is you go to the big, so this has to be um, done experimentally. Um, so you go to the big, the, the big book of specific rotations and, and look it up. Okay, it's a constant and each molecule is different. Okay, multiply that times the concentration, right, um, times the, um, the path length. Okay, because if you go through 10 times as much um, material, right, you're going to bend it 10 times as much. So you have to take that into account. Usually this ends up being one decimeter, okay, and this ends up being either like a grams per, grams per mole or a molar or something like that. But for the, for an, um, for the exam, what you're basically going to do is you're going to get three of these, and um, 
you got to give me the fourth. Okay, so for here, right, we have a rotation, an actual rotation of 25 degrees. Okay, and we want to know what the specific rotation is. Okay, so we need to know this one. Okay, but we know that the molarity of the solution was point, um, 35 millimolar, 0 0.035 molar, and that the path length was one decimeter. And so usually it ends up being, which is 10 centimeters, and usually it's nice to just divide by one. Okay, and so it ends up being the specific rotation is at 25 divided by 0 0.035 times 1, and so it ends up being this. Um, oh, this should be, dang it, I thought I switched this. This should be the um, 25 degrees. This should say 25 degrees here and here. Or excuse me, 20 degrees. Uh, 20 degrees Celsius here, because it does make a little bit of a difference in the temperature. Uh, but it ends up being 794, uh, excuse me, 714 okay, degrees per molar per decimeter. So, okay, it's just a constant, okay? So like we said with racemic mixtures, okay, you're going to have a slightly reduced version of this, or it's not, if it's an equal mixture, a, a purely racemic mixture, they're going to they're gonna knock each other out as far as rotation goes, um, stuff like that, and so um, you're not going to see any, any rotation, okay? But if there's slightly one more than the other, it's, there's going to bend one way, but just not as much as you would expect. Okay, and that, and when you do that, you get what's called the an anti-americ excess. Okay, and basically, all that is, okay, is um, the the percent A minus the percent B. Okay, the other way that you can do it is if if it's um, the experimental rotation divided by the theoretical, what it what it should be. Okay and then times 100%. Okay, that's how it was originally done, right? So so if you get if you were expecting it to be 60 when in fact it should have been if you were expecting 100 but you were expecting it to be 60, that means the ex, an antimeric excess is 60 is is 60%. Okay, here, right? So with that so, so for here, um, so your case a mixture of 97% D in antimer and 3% L, L in antimer, what is the antimeric excess? So that would be just 97 minus 3, and so that ends up being 94%. So your percent EE is that. So it's reported as 90, 94%. Okay. The other way, yeah, so with that, so, okay? So with that, so, okay? Good luck.